In this video, I'm going to show you how to choose a safe discharge location for your patient, whether that's a SNF, LTAC, home with home health, etc. State the nature of your medical emergency. So, how to choose a safe discharge location for your patients. When patients are admitted to the hospital, the two most common places that will discharge patients are either to a SNF or to home. But besides SNF and home, there's actually a whole variety of places that a patient could potentially go to, whether that's an LTAC, acute rehab, long-term care, otherwise known as a nursing home, assisted living facility or board and cares, and or room and boards. The whole point of discharge planning while we are working in the hospital is to find the right location for our patient and make sure that it's the safest place for them and it prevents them from coming back to the hospital or needing to be readmitted. So let's just go through all of these locations one by one and we're gonna start with the highest security uh, placement location first and that's gonna be the LTAC. So the LTAC stands for Long-Term Acute Care Hospital. You can basically think of it as a step-down unit from the hospital. And typically when I'm discharging patients to this location, I'm thinking trached patients, vented patients, or otherwise patients who are going to need complex management that needs more frequent uh, physician oversight, as well as higher nurse to patient ratios. So definitely for um, patients that are trached or vented, that's what you should be thinking, but also any patients with complex care. Next, let's talk about acute rehab, also known as inpatient rehabilitation, and these are for patients who really require intense daily therapy, whether that's with physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, etc. And the caveat is that they need to be able to do at least three hours of rehab a day. If they are not able to tolerate that amount of rehab, then they do not qualify for acute rehab. A lot of times this is going to be stroke patients, and to send patients to acute rehab, uh, you generally need to talk to the physiatrist at PM and R. Uh, to see if the patient qualifies. All right, and now we're going to talk about probably the biggest category, which is skilled nursing facilities. And we send a whole host of patients to these locations. But one thing that I want to clarify right off the bat is that skilled nursing facilities, there's a lot of overlap with long-term care or nursing homes. And a lot of times you actually see that skilled nursing facilities and nursing homes are actually in the same building itself. So let's start with SNFs first. So SNFs SNFs are also known as subacute rehab or SAR and also known as post-acute care. Those are some different names that you're going to hear, which can all add to the confusion about what a SNF is, especially when you're trying to explain to a patient that they're going to a nursing facility for rehab and they're not going to a nursing home. So this is definitely for any patients that have skilled needs that can't be completed at home, whether they are not independent enough to do it at home or they're not safe enough to do it at home. This is when you're going to be starting to think about skilled nursing facility. And the four most common reasons for why a patient will need skilled therapy very high yield is physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, wound care, usually for stage three ulcers or above, IV antibiotics, where they can't manage the IV antibiotics at home, and tube feeding that's new. So these are the four most common reasons that patients will need skilled needs to go to a SNF. The goal of going to a SNF is to discharge the patient. And in that sense, there's this concept that the patient must be rehabable, okay? They have to be actually able to participate in physical therapy. They need to be making functional gains. If there's somebody who cannot communicate with the physical therapist, then there's no way that they're going to get better. Or if there's somebody that literally cannot tolerate physical therapy, then they're not a good candidate for SNF because over the course of three weeks, there's no chance that they're going to get to a better functional status and be able to leave that SNF. Okay, so if they're going to a SNF, the goal is for them to get there, get better, and then eventually get moved to a different placement location quickly. Okay, so with a SNF, we're looking to see if they can go eventually to an assisted living facility, a room and board, or home. Those are all viable locations that we're going to try and discharge people from a SNF. So in terms of staff availability, how frequently are they going to be seen by an MD and how many nurses are there per how many patients, okay? So a physician must evaluate a patient in a skilled nursing facility once every 30 days. And then after the first 90 days, then they can change that to evaluating them once every 60 days. In terms of the nurse to patient ratio, we generally see ratios such as one nurse for 20 to 25 patients. And so you can see how that's a big difference from in the hospital where you typically have one nurse to four patients or something like that. Finally, a really good question to know, at least for you know when you're counseling your patients, is what is the average length of stay? And the average length of stay for patients in a skilled nursing facility 
facility is actually about 20 days. And finally, I want to go over one important topic, which is going to be the cost, because this is something that's going to be hugely important to the patient and also to knowing what this is actually going to cost your patient when you're trying to get them out of the hospital. So first of all, there's this concept that in order for their stay in the skilled nursing facility to be covered by Medicare, they need to have stayed three midnights in the hospital in order for it to be covered by Medicare. Uh, one caveat, though, is that now that COVID has been going on, this has actually been temporarily waived. So this three midnight requirement to be covered by Medicare is actually no longer in place at this current time. The first 20 days that a patient is at a sniff is 100% covered by Medicare. They don't have to pay anything out of pocket. But then the next 80 days, there is about a $185 a day copay. And then finally, Medicare will cover a maximum of 100 days. So if patients are starting to go over that, then they're going to have to start paying out of pocket, which is incredibly expensive. And many patients are not going to be able to afford this, but it's going to be somewhere along the lines of $400 to $500 a day from what I saw, or $12,000 to $15,000 a month. Okay. So knowing the cost is very important in terms of getting your patients to a skilled nursing facility. Now, what if a patient continues to have skilled needs, but can get independent enough to leave the skilled nursing facility? Okay, that's when you start thinking about, does this patient need long-term care or do they need a nursing home? Uh, these are basically equivalent uh, terms for each other. So long-term care, nursing home, also known as custodial care, you'll also hear this term. So basically patients who still need significant help with their ADLs, they have skilled needs, which means they're not gonna be as good of candidates for these um, locations, which don't provide as many skilled needs. Uh, they're not rehabable, so they can't work with PT. They're not really gonna make much functional gains, uh, and they have no other safe discharge location. What is the goal in long-term care or nursing homes? The long-term goal is to maintain their current level of function, Whereas in a skilled nursing facility or subacute rehab, the goal is to improve the current level of function to get them to discharge to some other location. Okay, in terms of the structure, this time you're really having a supervising RN who's overseeing LPNs, CNAs, or MAs, and that stands for licensed practical nurses, certified nursing assistants, and medical assistants. Um, and sometimes you will have a physician, but I'm not sure if it's actually required for a physician to actually be seeing them that often. And in terms of cost, it's still going to be quite pricey for patients because they're still requiring that skilled care. And so out of pocket from the patient or family, this is often called the spend down. And this is going to be anywhere from 8000 to 15 thousand dollars a month now if patients had purchased long-term care insurance beforehand they can sometimes uh, qualify for some coverage through that but this is pretty rare and then also if they have medicaid medicaid can sometimes cover a portion of their cost but it's not going to cover everything oh sorry i put that here uh, in this next line right here so big points skilled nursing facility and nursing homes often in the same location but two entirely different structures and goals and costs too for the patients one question that's going to come up quite frequently when you're in the hospital and getting ready to discharge patients is why do SNFs often prefer to save beds for subacute rehab patients rather than for long-term care patients, okay? The reason for that is because with subacute rehab, this is covered through Medicare, which provides them a higher compensation, whereas long-term care patients are often gonna be covered through Medicaid, which is lower compensation. And again, they're gonna struggle to see if these patients will ever be able to leave their facility. So, you know, are you gonna get these shorter-term patients who give you better compensation? Or are you gonna have these long-term patients that don't give you much compensation and this is all very important to skilled nursing facilities because they basically get paid a set amount for a single patient and so if there's a super complicated patient with tons of complex different needs physical therapy speech therapy occupational therapy tube feeds iv antibiotics blah 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 that patient is going to be taking up a ton of resources it's going to cost the sniff a ton of money to to stay there but they're still only going to be receiving the same set amount from medicare so that's why if you have a patient like that, a SNF is also going to be very hesitant to take somebody like that because it's going to cost them a ton of money uh, and they're basically going to lose money by taking that patient. All right, now let's move on to assisted living facilities and board and cares, okay? So assisted living facility, also known as a senior living community or independent retirement communities, that's what an assisted living facility is. And so this one, most importantly, is that the patient has no skilled needs, okay? But they do require caregiver support for their ADLs and 
IADLs. So I'm just going to draw out an assisted living facility for you guys. And I'm just going to go over that there's three different places within an assisted living facility. You have basically three different levels of care. You have, first of all, independent living, which is basically somebody who's able to take care of all of their ADLs on their own, but they like to live in a social environment. They're going to partic participate in the uh, activities there. They're going to have some food that's kind of prepped for them. So that's independent. They're basically fully independent. Then in the middle, you have true assisted living where they're going to be having caregivers come every day to help out with daily ADLs. And then the highest level of care is going to be called a memory care unit. This is often a locked unit and this is going to be moderate to severe dementia patients who really need a higher level of supervision, need more medication management, and they pose either a wandering risk or maybe getting agitated at night. So they're in their separate memory care unit that's locked um, just so they can get a higher level of care at that location. And then we have what's called a board in care. And a board in care is pretty much the same as an assisted living facility. However, instead of having hundreds of residents, they have four to six residents at most. So it's a lot more personal. Um, it can sometimes be higher level of care because there's closer supervision, but it can also you know, be lower because board and cares are run by private citizens. And so there's a much higher variability in the quality of your board and cares. So the quality definitely varies between board and care and assisted living facility, but essentially they're the same level of care. The big difference is how many residents they're taking care of okay and then in terms of costs another very very important thing for your patients but an assisted living facility is also quite expensive it's going to be costing five thousand to ten thousand dollars a month for most of your patients unless they have long-term care insurance or if they can get some supplemental coverage from medicaid and then a board of care will probably be a little bit cheaper uh, around four thousand to eight thousand dollars a month Next, we're going to talk about room and board. And the reason I wanted to talk about room and board is because I was actually initially confused and I thought it was interchangeable with board and care. But board and care and room and board are actually completely different levels of care. Okay, so this is not the same as a board and care. This is basically just a room in a house and the patient is living independently. Um, often we get these living situations for patients who are struggling with homelessness is uh, what's been the case in my experience. And also for patients struggling with substance use use disorders. You can consider something called a halfway house, which is something that's really directed towards getting people through rehab and getting through their substance use um, uh, disorders and addictions. Finally, let's talk about kind of the holy grail of where we can send our patients, and that's going to be to send them home. So what kind of services are available at home? So first, for non-skilled care, for example, if they need help with bathing, getting groceries, cooking, or showering, or getting dressed, this is when the patient should be able to get a home caregiver, okay? The costs for this are gonna range from 15 to $35 per hour, and this is often out of pocket from the patient or family. The main thing for providing skilled care is called home health, okay? This includes things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, nursing, speech therapy, etc. And this is covered by Medicare. What we need to do as physicians is we need to provide this face-to-face -face certification which states that the patient is homebound. And that's how we're going to get this patient qualified for home health that's covered with Medicare. And this is a huge reason why we're able to send a lot of patients home is because we have home health physical therapy, home health nursing for IV antibiotics, etc. Next, we have IHSS, which is another thing that can help patients uh, succeed at home. And this is called in-home supportive services. This is a state-funded compensation to cover for private caregivers or for family members who are acting as caregivers. But the main thing for this is that it's going to provide a little bit of help to patients uh, in terms of providing some financial compensation, but it's very limited. So uh, they basically grant a certain hours per week to a patient. So if based on how many needs they have, they'll give them 35 hours a week of IHSS. So th those 35 hours are going to be covered. But oftentimes when you talk to family, you're going to realize that they are working far more than 35 hours a week. They're working like 50, 60, 70, 80, even more than that. Um, and so they're only getting compensated for a portion of the work they're doing. But that little bit of um, compensation does help. So that is definitely something to know about and something to help out caregivers, um, especially patients who have financial needs uh, to get the care that they need. All right, so that was my quick summary of potential discharge locations that you can send patients to from the hospital. And again, majority of the time, it's gonna be SNF versus home. 
but knowing the different locations that a patient could be coming from, what living situations are available is actually very useful. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please leave them down in the comments below. And if you have any you know, other tips, I would also love to hear your comments down below as well. And if you enjoyed this video, if it was useful for you, please subscribe uh, for more content like this. I would love to make stuff like this and I hope it was helpful for you. Again, I really hope you enjoyed this video and thanks again for watching.